Welcome to the United States of America podcast. I'm your host, Neethi Bali, and we are broadcasting live from the Food Church here on North Carolina. If you've missed past episodes, please be sure to take the time to at least watch the first episode to have a proper introduction to our conversations. Please be aware that we expect you to behave with honor in our comment section, and we are a people at peace. We have declared peace to all nations around the world. This is not a marketing or a promotional channel. We are shining a light on knowledge that is being hidden from you, and we are sharing the truth about your birthright and your inheritance. We have marshals at arms that are designated as moderators who are assisting in the comment section. If you have any questions, please put them in all caps and only enter them once per show. I am joined on air with our North Carolina Marshal at Arms, Cynthia Pinkston. Now I am proud to introduce you to Justice Anna Maria, who is joining us live from Alaska today. Good morning. Good morning, Anna. How's everybody today? We are doing really, really good. We're doing really, really good, right, Cynthia? <laughs> Okay, we ha we are excited. We are excited because yesterday, Anna, like last night, you called us into. Okay, I'm gonna just call it Operation Warp Speed. Okay, and look, James needs you. We all need relief, which 100% includes you. Enough is enough. And you called out the military, you called out the criminals, and you're calling out the assemblies to get to work harder because we're ready to come, you know, to see this all come to fruition. And you asked everyone to focus. And if they had nothing else to give, you asked for prayers. So here we are. We're hearing you. We are loving you and James, and we're ready to work. Okay. So thank you so much for showing up today and every day. And here's a lot of questions that we need answers, uh, you know, for rehearsing our new positions more powerfully. Like, look, we we need drills to run so that we can prepare to be fully seated. We have no example to follow and no seated state to apprentice with. So we need to kind of run some drills. And so to get assembled, we need to comprehend the assembly line and the detailed operation of each of the positions. So one of the first questions I'd like to ask you today is, you know, regarding this chairperson, last week you were saying if the General Assembly wants to ask uh, or, you know, say anything to the state of state, like we can do this through the chairperson position. And it seems to come with like an air of power. But like when I look at it, um, is the chairperson position one where they remain kind of more neutral and silent until the General Assembly, Assembly is ready to communicate with the state of state like what are the characteristics and the qualifications required for this position and what is the authority of the chairperson we don't have positional authority Nisi. okay just it's if you could describe our position. what yeah. a, a chairperson in, in our system is a spokesperson for the assembly so the the way that we do business is we bring forward questions uh, and when we're using the General Assembly as, as the clout behind it, uh, what we do is, is we bring a, a question before the General Assembly and they answer it. You know, um, do, do you want to uh, end uh, chemtrail spraying over North Carolina? Yes or no? <laughs> okay. Um, and, and so then the 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 chair of the assembly, the chairperson of the assembly, is the spokesperson for the assembly. They write a note to the uh, state of state governor and the state of state legislature, and they uh, present the problem uh, and the resolution of the state assembly to end uh, chemtrail spraying over North Carolina. That gives them uh, a tacit direction for them to take action in terms of the legislature, but it also gives them tacit permission to use funds to go out and find who's doing this spraying and stop them. And this is the, this is the way that our government is supposed to work. We're supposed to tell our employees what we want done, and then they're supposed to do it. Okay. And so it hasn't been working that way because our assemblies haven't been in session. 
But now that our assemblies are in session and we, we have the wherewithal to, to form a properly constituted general assembly, where everybody is claiming their birthright as an American, and they're all standing on the land and soil, and they're all doing everything according to Hoyle and Doyle. Uh, they are empowered to uh, elect a chairperson for the assembly to act as their spokesperson. Uh, that spokesperson is then empowered to write a letter to the state legislature and the state of state governor, uh, lay out the, the resolution of the state assembly, you know, resolve that uh, uh, chemtrail uh, pollution is, is a, a concern and, and problem. Uh, these, uh, these dumping activities have been shown to uh, you know, be spraying strontium, barium, uh, aluminum oxide, and other inflammatory metallic oxide, um, aluminum oxide, and other um, uh, dangerous and incendiary pollutants that affect uh, health and uh, the volatility of uh, forest fires and increasing the likelihood of forest fires and uh, uh, disease processes and absorption into the food chain and blah, 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 and we don't want it anymore. Uh, these, these people have been doing this without any permission, uh, operating out of uh, unknown clandestine bases, uh, and have been uh, polluting our air and our land and endangering our welfare, we want them stopped. Secondary question. This chairman position, give us a, a contrast between that and the peacekeeping, uh, peacekeeping liaison. Has nothing to do with the peacekeeping liaison. Uh, the... the the chairman, once elected, uh, is expected to uh, be the presiding officer who, you know, slams the gavel and brings the general assembly in into a uh, meeting session, uh, and then they are the one that is calling upon uh, people to speak and and kind of acting as the monitor for the meeting, you know. And then uh, when questions are posed to the assembly and it results in action that the assembly wants taken, such as, you know, sending a letter to the state of state legislature, as we just described, then the assembly chairperson is the one who's responsible for sending and um, signing that letter. You know, a committee might draft the content of the letter, but then the... Uh, um, chairman would be the one that signs it for the assembly and sends it. That was kind of what we wanted to get a, a clear picture of, because it feels like, um, I was going to say, so then like, what is the international uh, business? How do they communicate? And does their communication go through the chairperson uh, later as well? And like the general case, assembly, like for jury nullification, all these uh, pillars that we're building, like this is what we want to know, like what is the chain of the communication? So it seems like the chairperson is the bridge between the assembly and the outside uh, state of state or anybody who we're addressing. Is that correct? Well, well there's certainly one of the, the contact points. Uh, they're the, the most visible contact point in terms of the General Assembly. Okay. Uh, and certainly when you are speaking in terms of, of the General Assembly within the state, um, they are definitely the one that is speaking for both ASCs and ASNs. Um, you know, it's, it's a, a wider uh, audience or a wider group that the General Assembly represents than the International Business Assembly, right? Okay. So if, if you have a resolution from the International Business Assembly, the, the chairman of the, in, of the um, International Business Assembly would be um, the one uh, that would be actually signing a letter and sending it to whomever. Most likely not the state of state legislature in that case. But, you know, it, say another uh, proposal to a business partner would be answered by the International Business Assembly chairman. 
And if it required both, then both the International Business Assembly and the, the General Assembly Chairman would be signing the letter and sending it to whomever. Um, you can see how that would work. Mm -hmm. and, you know, the, the, um, the Chief Justice of the court system is obviously the, the chief officer in terms of uh, being able to uh, send out decisions and, and, you know, put the stamp of approval on important uh, judicial decisions. Um, so you've got, basically, you've got four people that uh, are not really exercising positional authority in the way that we've been taught to think of it, but who are, it's their job <laughs> to to speak for the assembly on matters pertaining to matters judicial, matters martial, matters um, international, and matters uh, within the state. Okay, and so like with with some of these notices, like the geoengineering or whatever, um, if we're working, I mean, it's kind of could be international for working with other states to try to do this, but. Um, <laughs> Yes, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can get hold of of, of the states surrounding you. You can get right. uh, hold of, of uh, Virginia and and uh, South, South Carolina, Carolina and Tennessee, and Tennessee, and and you, you know you could definitely have like a multi-state accord, right? Uh, you know, and you could definitely inform the um, state of North Carolina that there's a multi-state accord according you know to um that that you are all determined that this practice of spraying chemicals is going to end mm -hmm. uh, and then they have the option then to undertake it as a separate action or to undertake it as a um a directed action but in any event for the the practice to end mm -hmm. and you know we don't, we don't really care who takes credit for it or if it's something that the state of state legislature takes up independently and, and acts upon or if they simply, um, you know, start assigning uh, resources to to do the work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like the operations of the state trust now uh, take place and we're not aware of whether the money comes from the state trust or the money comes from the state of state. Mm -hmm. We don't know. We don't care. What what we care about is that the service that is needed is there. Mm. So in these practical terms, you know, like, look, you weren't supposed to be the teacher for everybody. You were just doing your job. And then this this happened. You called the, you know, all the states and then no one knew what to do. You emergently are doing that. Look, this is on the job training we're doing right now. That's how I feel. And so I'm, I'm, we're asking these very specifically because we don't want to misstep. We don't, you know, we, we don't know what we're doing in that sense. A hundred percent. We're kind of, it's kind of like, we're kind of guessing. And, you know, for the folks who are in the assemblies, there's just always this contention of, you know, not wanting to have any authority. And we're like, we're not trying to have authority. You said this one time about the Federation, like, you know, uh, we, we are trying to help you get going. We have to, you're, you're telling them like, you know, we need to make sure you're doing this right. Or, or however you put it, you, you, put it more eloquently, I'm sure. I just, what we're, what we're wanting to know is in the process of getting assembled, because look, we're trying to be warp speed. We're trying to get, we're trying to do the, the thing so that, you, you know, everybody wants the relief. You need it too. It's not just us, everybody, right? So if we're working in that effort, right, and we're like, okay, what are the pieces that each of, each of the pillars, like we know that the, um, the general assembly would be doing the jury nullification parts and pieces. What we want to know is, you know, what does the general assembly minimally need to begin the jury nullification process? Are there steps to get to this point? Like literally one, two, three, like what are the steps that for them to get to that process? I, I think that you're misunderstanding something here. Oh, um, Jury nullification just takes place naturally in the course of considering cases. It's not some separate process. It's it's um, a it's a right and responsibility that our juries have that their juries don't. 
Okay. Oh, I think that what we're thinking is that in the, like, how does the, like if the journal assembly, we, we're, maybe we're having a bigger misunderstanding. Okay. But how does the jury, how does our journal assembly nullify the state of state laws? Okay. Well, something comes up that involves one of the state of state laws. Okay. Uh, say that uh, someone is being accused by the state of state of having violated uh, state statute, blah, 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 right? Mm -hmm. And you consider this as a concurrent general jurisdiction court. You consider it because it's one of your people that's being accused, right? Okay. So you look at this state of state statute and you say, well, that language is completely you know, it's entirely vague. It could it could mean anything. You know, this this is just not a workable statute. It it's not a you know it's not properly stated. It doesn't really tell you what the nature of the offense is or how it can occur. Like with a thought crime, for example. Ah. Uh. You know, it's not something that's that's real. Okay, so our jury could kick it out and say, "Nah, that's that's not properly written. It's void for vagueness." That's one of the things that, that is real typical with uh, legislation is it's void for vagueness. It's not properly stated. You can't uh, act upon it with any certainty that you're actually applying it correctly or what it means. Okay. So you kick it back to the state of state legislature and, and basically say, nah, <laughs> <laughs> that isn't going to work. Bye. <laughs> and so it throws it back in their lap. Now they mm -hmm. can look at it and they can say, well, you know, uh, maybe you know, what we really meant was, and they can tweak and twerk it and they can come up with something that is more specific and, and you know, they can improve their work and, and actually make it make sense. But when they do so, they're going to be aware that the public is aware and mm. the public is watching what they're doing. Uh -huh. And so they're going to be more careful in their construction. They're going to be more explicit in, in, in their words. They're going to uh, make a bigger effort to justify what they're doing. Uh -huh. And if it can't be justified or if it can't be properly expressed, that law is just going to go away and uh -huh. you don't have to worry about it anymore. Um, now, here's the part. Uh -huh. um, Back in the 90s, I did a study of, of this very subject here in Alaska and found out that the legislature was passing between two and 300 new laws a year. Yes, the tripwires they put everywhere, yeah. Well over 2,000 per decade. Yeah. And the public and the employees of the state of state uh, get stuck trying to keep up with this, and it's impossible. Uh, you know, who's going to publish 200 new laws in the upshot of, of what this all means to you, Joe Average, uh, and you're going to remember all these new laws and, and uh, you know, how you might be affected and how you might have to uh, be obligated to obey these. And then on top of that, uh, somebody has to pay for enforcing all this. Mm. So you can see that it's absolutely crazy. Uh, if you multiply that across, you know, 50 states, uh, you've got 100,000 new laws and, all, you know, you have to have all the infrastructure, you have to have the judges, you have to have the courtrooms, you have to have the police officers, everything has to, it all just, so that the more the legislature does, the, the more expense there is, the more oppressive everything is, the more confused everything is. And there's no, there's no pressure valve. There's no stopcock that's saying, no, put an end to that. That isn't going to work. There's nobody, you know, there's no reject file. It's just everything keeps being in, you know, input into the bin mm. from the state, state legislature and all these uh, rules, regulations, and statutes just keep pouring in and building up until now we have 80 million, mm -hmm. 80 million mm -hmm. statutes, codes, and regulations that we're supposed to be obeying and enforcing, which is obviously crazy. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And it's because our juries haven't been in action and haven't been nullifying this nonsense coming out of the state of state legislatures. Mm. So I have a better question then. So I, I think that we're not looking at this correctly because there is this idea um, that, okay, the, when the journal, as the journal assembly is being prepared to get the courts up, you know, Anna, they're trying to figure out what to do to get ready. We don't know what to do to get ready because look, if you've never washed dishes before, you don't know that it would be better to use hot water versus the cold water. You don't know that it might be, you might need to wear dish gloves. You might need a certain kind of sponge. You might not, this sponge might work better than that sponge. You know, they don't really know. So what I'm hearing you say is we only are going to nullify something like that if it affects one of us because we have our own courts and we're not supposed to be messing around in theirs anyway once we have our stuff set up. And so we don't need to be worrying about that or thinking about that unless it is directly affecting us in this red hot minute and we want to do something about it. Remember our law. Remember the nature of our law. There has to be an injury to consider. Oh, yes. No, no, no. I'm just trying to clean all this up, okay? Because yeah. what, what's happening is that they're preparing to send out a whole bunch of information to these people to nullify a bunch of stuff, which I'm hearing from you doesn't need to be, we're not going to tell them how to run their stuff. We're just not going to participate in their things because we'll have our own. Well, and, when, no, Neethi, look. Yes. When something that they've done injures one of us, uh -huh. then we have the right to consider it in our court. And we can consider both the facts of the case and the law. And we can sit in judgment of the law. We can look at the law and say, no, that doesn't make any sense. Or we can look at it and say, yeah, it's a good law. We should have that. Okay, our court gets to decide that. Mm. If we find that their law is, is big, too vague to be properly administered, if we find that it's unjust, uh, if we find that it is, um, you know, cruel and unjust or, you know, any number of things that we can find in our courts that that say, nah, that, that just isn't going to work for us, mm -hmm. then we can send that law or statute in their case back to them and say, this doesn't work. So in that situation, we just, okay, so we're going down the list of the things, we're checking it out. And in that moment then, um, how does the journal assembly communicate with them to nullify their laws? Is it a notice? Does it go through the chairperson writing the notice and presenting the notice? Or is the journal assembly putting it together and writing it and giving it to them to, I mean, how is the communication done? You've got a decision in a court case. That's part of the decision that the law is null and void. So we have to wait until it's in the middle of a court case before we have to null and void it? Or because like on one hand, I hear you I'm saying- I'm trying to make this really clear, Nithy. Look, you have to have a case. You have to have an injury. It has to come up, okay? Our courts- So, so we have to wait until it's an it injury. Up. Yeah, we have to wait until it comes up before we can address it. Right. You have to wait until there's a case and an injury. Our law only works when there is an injury to someone. We do not have thought crimes. We don't have theoretical crimes. We don't have any kind of controversy that's theoretical. Okay. We don't indulge in that crap. What we do is if somebody is hurt or their property is harmed, then... <laughs> We swing into action. Then our courts have plenary power to consider both the facts of the individual case mm -hmm. and the law itself. Thank you. This was a big clearing that you just did, Anna, because if they're in there right now preparing to try to foresee something and nullify a bunch of things and make lists and work on it. No, so look, look, I already told you how you can affect what's going on in your state legislature and you can affect what they focus on by communicating with them, okay? So if you've got some big issue like chemtrail spraying right. or um, uh, 5G. 
sale of farmland to foreign governments. Yes. Or, you know, things of that sort. The state general assembly can be brought forward on that question and they can, you know, vote on it right there and then. And, you know, based on that, a, a communication can be drafted. That communication can be presented back to the General Assembly. They can put their, their John Henry, their, their uh, stamp of approval on it. And boom, it goes to the state of state governor. It goes to the secretary of state. It goes to the chief justice. It goes to the head of the legislature. And then the state of state legislature has to sit down and go, hmm, you know, gee, they've got a good point there. Maybe we should act upon that ourselves. Maybe we should, um, you know, put this into a form that we can act upon within our system. And then we can go out and, um, you know, have our officers start looking for these airfields and these operations that are dumping this stuff on our people. And, you know, maybe their state of state legislature will then take it up as an issue for themselves and use their resources and their people to go out and, and nab these guys that are doing the chemtrail spraying. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they'll look at it and go, well, that's a worthy directive from the state assembly. Uh, okay, so we can now uh, access, uh, directly access and have direct authorization to access uh, funding from the state trust to uh, promote an, a, a new effort here to go out and find these guys. And, you know, the Department of Public Safety can have a special issues unit that uh, goes out and deals with chemtrail spraying or uh, the um, land recorder's office can have a special unit that deals with um, farmland acquisitions by foreign governments or you know it, like i say it doesn't really matter to us if they take it out of the state trust or they take it out of their own funds what what matters to us is that the chemtrails stop what matters to us is that the buy-up by foreign governments stops. Um, what matters to us is that uh, the quality of our lives is preserved. Got you know, yeah. and and so we can use the general assembly process to make those kinds of big, broad policy uh, directives back to the state of state legislature. No problem. But on an individual basis, when it comes to, you know, statute AS 103.93A, okay, uh -huh, uh -huh. then we need a specific case where we, we look at it because it's impacting one of our people, it's injuring one of our people. And we look at it and we go, well, is this, you know, number one, what are the facts of the case? Was the guy guilty or not? And number two, was the law fair? Was it workable? Was it, you know, was the law right? Okay. Right. right. So we get to try both the facts and the law. Mm -hmm. And then our, our decision about our people and our land and soil is ours. It's not theirs. They don't get to comment on it. We have the superior general jurisdiction. Yeah. So, you know, uh, they can they can find that so and so create, you know, was um, did something against their statute. But if they don't have jurisdiction over so and so and so and so has been accused of a crime in their jurisdiction and we look at it and we say, ah, no, we bounce that out. That isn't a crime in our jurisdiction on our land and soil. That isn't a crime then it has to go away and they have to administer their own crap. You see, they have to, they have to then go back and go, Oh, well, we may not like it, but uh, they get to judge the fact in the law. And so, you know, our, our, our determinations on certain things just basically don't count and can be countermanded and um, removed by action by the the uh, state court and that's just that's the way our system works all right next question 
If in 2021, the original ASN paperwork was published on the LRS, and then we moved in 2024, rather than transfer ASN paperwork from the defunct LRS to the LRO, can we update our address listed for a fee schedule and assume names doc in current address and give an updated ASN network, uh, ASN paperwork to the new state? They're, they're talking about the LRS going down and the, and the transfer. We got people trying to transfer into North Carolina and they don't know whether to start over or just move the paperwork. Well, what you do is you bring your paperwork from the LRS, which should have been, you know, you, you should have your copy of, of the finished paperwork, right? And then you bring it to the LRO in the state where you've moved, right? And they accept that as having been, um, you know, done by another state uh, years ago. And uh, here you are, you're applying to uh, be included in the LRO in North Carolina. Fine. So you use that old paperwork, you accept it, uh, and you, it, you know, you record it in the LRO. Uh, as long as you've got your paperwork from the LRS, there's really no reason why it shouldn't be accepted. State, and, state to state. We're talking state about to state. State to state. Great. And then um, after that, then, of course, then you've got a new credential from North Carolina in this case. And you're a North Carolinian because you've moved to North Carolina. And this, this is your intention to stay in North Carolina. It's really pretty simple. The only thing difficult about moving state to state is that um, for a year and a day while you're getting settled and, and making your commitment, uh, you are in kind of a limbo land because you're not really in a state assembly at that time because you're still transitioning from one state to another. But once that year and a day has passed and you're still intending on staying in your new state, well, welcome aboard. That's, that's good. I, this is, uh, that year and a day thing is there to prevent the kind of situations where people come from California and, and they move to Nevada and uh, things don't pan out the way they thought. And so they wind up going back to California within two, three, six months, whatever. Uh, or they uh, come from Wisconsin and, and move to Iowa for a new job and uh, the job doesn't pan out or, you know, any number of things. They, they move home to Minnesota to be with mom and dad and, and uh, you know, um, mom dies of a, a stroke and uh, then dad gets pneumonia and it, it's just not working out. They, they go to a different state. And so our experience has been that within about a year, people typically know if they're going to find what they need and, and are going to make the adjustment to a new state or not. So that's why that's there. All right. Next question. Josh is wanting to know the credential cards on California say, the United States of America instead of the capital T with a lowercase u United capital S States of America. Should this be corrected? This Absolutely is not. Absolutely not. The Federation of States is the authority in international jurisdiction. The uh, small United States of America refers to the old federal republic, which has been dormant for 160 years. So it doesn't even exist at this point. The Federation exists. And so, and the Federation is the ultimate authority in international jurisdiction. So it would be under our bailiwick and not theirs anyhow. Um, issues of, of nationality are within our purview, not theirs. 
Uh, you'll see that if you if you read the 1787 Constitution, that there are, are things that are notably absent from that and all subsequent constitutions issued for the other subcontractors in 1789 and 1790. One of the things that it does not talk about is nationality for people who were born here. Okay, it, it does not talk about things of that nature being part of the Federal Republic bailiwick at all. Um, it does not talk about health. There isn't a single word about health in any of the constitutions. You know, the only way that they can even bring health in for any consideration under the constitutions is as a public welfare issue. Okay, there are so many things that they did not grant any specific power to any subcontractor to resolve because it was intended that these issues would be taken care of by the states and the people themselves. Now, health is a private matter, and our government has always been a private matter. Religion is a private matter. Um, there, there are things that we do not address as a government uh, and we don't intend for our, our delegated authority to be abused uh, by our subcontractors for them to address. Uh, some things are just sacrosanct and they aren't to be messed with by anybody but the people themselves. Nicole wants to know, how do we intake cases and keep them organized in our journal assembly? Oh, well, good question. Every state has to basically figure out how they're going to um, set up a, an intake process. Now, we have provided a um, uh, basically a, a criminal report form that can be used or adapted for state use. Um, most of the time, because you're dealing with injury cases, you're going to have two kinds of cases. Uh, you're going to have crimes where somebody walked up to somebody and punched them in the face, you know, assault. Uh, or you're going to have um, issues that are about monetary damages. Um, somebody uh, kicked over the trash can uh, and uh, it crashed into the gate and damaged both the trash can and the gate. Okay, well, so then you've got a monetary damages suit. So those are going to be the two kinds of things that our courts um, consider because, again, we don't get into thought crimes. And we don't get into petty infractions. There has to be an injured party. And so our law is very simple. You have two kinds of cases that you can have. And, you know, so I would say start thinking in terms of, of you know, two sets of folders, <laughs> red folders and green folders, <laughs> and two sets of numbering systems, you know, uh, monetary claims, uh, injury claims, and uh, combined you know, th you know, red, yellow, green, and and uh, a, a slightly different numbering system for each kind of case, because you'll have cases that combine both personal, uh, physical injury, like you know, a car wreck can can have you know bodily injury to the the claimant, as well as damage to the car. Okay, so you'll have combined cases that involve both a personal injury and a material loss, okay? Now, most of those things are going to be taken care of uh, simply under our, um, our insurance programs. You know, most of the things uh, that are like that will be taken care of um, to the extent made possible by man, you know? We can't, we can't possibly make up for a lot of things. Let's, let's, be honest about that too. Uh, if somebody gets in a car and is driving drunk and kills your daughter, um, there's no way to recoup for that. And, you know, it, should they be hung? Now, these, these are the kinds of questions that, that our society has to grapple with. This is what we have to determine. And so, Anyway, there are some things that come up that are injuries of a kind that we cannot address in a court. So let's, or at least we can't address 
making restitution in a court is what I should say. Vengeance, to an extent, that isn't really a court's business either. Um, justice is a court's business. And so in considering some cases, um, there's no restitution possible. And let's, let's all, everybody be aware of that because there's a lot of things that have been done here for the past 160 years for which there is no restitution. We cannot make up for the fact that, for example, your father um, spent his life div digging dish ditches instead of um, being the engineer he was meant to be. Okay, there are things that we can't fix. So within those uh, limitations and constraints, however, we do have quite a latitude in terms of restitution to the victim. We do have quite a few uh, insurance options that safeguard people from catastrophic losses. Uh, and we do have uh, a foreseeable need for both uh, a case system that deals with material damages, uh, cases that deal with actual physical injury, bodily injury, and cases that combine both. So I would be setting up my uh, case system uh, for the, for the uh, jural assemblies with an eye to that and a numerical system that determines, okay, this is a, this is a bodily injury case. This is a uh, financial damages case. This is a combined case. Can county just know if the county can raise their general assembly before the state? In theory, yes. In theory, yes. Um, I'm not sure it would be a recommended thing to do because then you are you're, you're setting sail without the guidance of the larger entity. Okay, uh, if the state general assembly is up and, and functioning, you have somewhere to go, you have a reference point, um, and you're, you're working in concert with the state in a cooperative fashion. If you, if you try to start something up within your, your county without reference to the larger framework of the state, then you wind up with situations where your county could, um, for example, uh, your county could, in theory, um, legalize the use of fentanyl. Say that you have a very liberal population in your county and, and you believe that, um, according to the lights that you see, that the Dutch government has the answer and that uh, by uh, making all drugs um, uh, legal in Polk County, uh, you're going to cut down on, on the number of um, arrests and, and the burden on your judicial system. And you're going to um, then uh, achieve some, some benefit um, for your county. Okay, so you throw open the doors and you say, all drugs are legal here. Well, what's going to happen? all of the surrounding counties are going to be affected because suddenly there's going to be this free for all party in Polk County, right? Everybody from all over is going to be going to Polk County to get their drugs and to hang out and party and la di da. Okay. And Polk County is going to be inundated with druggies that want the drugs and that are going to go to Polk County and that are going to lay around in your public parks and they're going to, you know, inhabit your hotels. And, you know, you're going to have a, a, a basically a gigantic free for all because of this one decision by your county court. And, um, you know, what I'm going to point out to you is that uh, when you start doing that kind of thing, then you're you're running the risk of being at odds with the other counties around you. You're running the risk of, of reaping some unexpected uh, situations that you're unprepared to handle. And 
it really does make sense to uh, work in tandem with other counties as part of a state system to make sure that you don't do something like that. Just saying. Sounds like uh, they could help stand the state up because the county is within the state. And mm -hmm. so why wouldn't you want your state stood up? That's what I'm trying to figure out still because that kind of just doesn't seem to make any sense there. Um, Genevieve wants to know, what does a notice of liability entail? Is there a template with instructions available? Well, yeah, there are lots of uh, lots of uh, basic templates available on the in, on the internet. A notice of liability is basically a uh, an instrument that you use um, when you want to in, fully inform someone that hey, you're liable for this. If you do this to me, then that happens. And uh, you know, you you do not want to uh, have a situation where you have a, um, a damage that you can foresee that you have not posted liability for. Okay, so the uh, state of state uh, acknowledges its intention to um, take your land by a, um, an eminent domain procedure. Okay, so you say, all right, well, you announced your intention to take my land uh, by enforcing eminent domain uh, that I don't feel I owe you since you're a state of state and I'm a state. <laughs> so you, um, you go ahead and you, you set out a notice of liability and you say, okay, well, the state of state has announced its intention to exercise powers of eminent domain over a parcel of land, uh, which I own uh, in the actual state. All right, I got a question for you. If a lawyer has been asked, what is the authority of probate court? And he prints out a statue, a state statue. How does one respond to that? It's a state of state statute. It's not a state statute. Okay. And, you know, there is no, there is nothing in the constitutions or anywhere else that um, actually gives any kind of validity to the existence of a probate court. Remember, Congress was only granted the authority to um, establish administrative courts. Jay wants to know, please give us a few examples of when an ecclesiastical deed poll would be used. Generally speaking, it isn't. Uh, an ecclesiastical deed poll is an instrument that establishes uh, a position or an ownership within the air jurisdiction. And it's an ecclesiastical law instrument. It's not used uh, in any other venue. Now you have to understand, as I've explained before, that the jurisdictions are like a layer cake, okay? Um, the, the sea is below the land and the land is below the air, okay? So, you know, if you just kind of envision a landscape with, or a seascape where you've got the sea in the foreground, you know, you have the nice beach and then you have the headlands and then you have the air above it. Well, okay, that's the scenario and that's the way the law works. Um, so uh, you, you claw your way through the sea, you get to the land and soil, and then you have the overall, you have the ecclesiastical law, the law of the jurisdiction of the air. Now, I had to claw my way all the way up this entire thing. Um, so I have an ecclesiastical deed poll. And the ecclesiastical deed poll just basically defines exactly who and what I am, uh, claims my rights under God, my divine uh, nature and status as a child of God, my, my identity uh, within the jurisdiction of the heir, um, my agreement to abide peaceably uh, and, and not harm other 
living beings, uh, you know, things of that basic nature that, that lay out the relationship between me and the divine and the church. Okay. And it's an, it's a kind of like a peace treaty now in the case of what we use the ecclesiastical deed poll for, uh, in which, uh, we accept responsibility to be, um, peaceful and you know to coexist and cohabitate the earth uh, without harming others and you know so it, it's basically a, a claim on on your identity your rights your divine status your relationship with uh, the divine and um, it uh, also then has a few uh, codicils that are devoted to you know uh, your intent to live peaceably among men and to um, basically do right by other people to cause no harm. And that's an ecclesiastical deed poll. Um, some people are getting all excited and thinking that this is the silver bullet because it's the highest form of law. But you will also notice it's one of the least enforced kinds of law. And it's nice to have it there in the background if you're someone like me who is uh, having to go through the entire process of, um, you know, establishing a basis and ground for the claims on assets for uh, a whole class of, of living beings. I mean, I had to I had to go through that, um, but. Joe Average will never have to have an ecclesiastical deed poll, nor will it be any practical use to him. Um, so I haven't gone into a whole big deal about, oh, well, and you have to fill out an ecclesiastical deed poll. Uh, because in a practical sense, while it's good for somebody that's going to be dealing with international diplomacy, and it's, it's good to have it there for someone who's going to um, be dealing with gigantic legal issues and recoupment actions, um, you're not going to need it down on the farm in Indiana. <laughs> RT wants to know, um, we have evidence that the people in general are being harmed by not getting remedy exemptions. Should we be filing claims against the bond or insurance companies as well as the principal? Do you understand this question? Oh, hell yes. Okay. Good. Uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about it. I'm actually, I've, I, something I think about on a regular basis is that um, you see what's happened. Every time that they do something that's basically illegal and unlawful, something that is shady and, and uh, questionable and, and, just isn't right, okay? Every time they do something like that, they have to um, they have to come forward and provide a remedy. They have to uh, do a kind of give with one hand, take with the other maneuver. Uh, a, a good example is the Federal Reserve Act uh, that took us off the gold standard. Uh, FDR comes in and, and he claims the right to go around house to house and collect all the private gold in America. This is theft. This is actual theft of, of a physical asset from an American. It's illegal. It's unlawful. It's completely over the top criminal. All right. So what do they do? Well, they publish in Title 12 of the Federal Code, they publish the remedy. And first of all, the remedy is you can exempt yourself. And if the people at the time had, had been up to speed, and if, if the remedy had been published broadly enough, and if a uh, specific direction had been given to the people of, of how they could be exempted from this, 
well, then they certainly would have exempted themselves in many cases. And I am sure that many women would have chosen to hold on to their wedding rings, for example, instead of just handing them over to these federal goons. However, the exemption and the process of getting an exemption was not published and was not made available. In fact, they didn't even publish the name of the official that would be, um, or the office of the official that would be responsible for providing exemption. And if you read uh, federal title 12, even to this day, they do not specifically name the officer that is responsible for establishing the exemption. Furthermore, as a remedy, they had to offer a, um, a quid pro quo that since they were taking away our ability to pay by taking away our gold and issuing these, these IOUs instead, they had to assume the expenses of their franchises. And you had the ability, the absolute congressionally designated right to, instead of extending them more assets or more credit, you had the right to do a debt swap with them forevermore, such that any, um, any, anything that was um, an expense that you supposedly owed uh, could be paid or actually discharged against credit that was owed to you. Okay, so um, we are being harmed by not getting remedy and exemptions, uh, especially remedy and exemptions under federal Title 12. And they still have not really provided access to those remedies and exemptions. And in 1982, they went so far as to uh, basically attempt to remove even the record of what the remedy and exemptions are uh, by setting aside House Joint Resolution 192 and Public Law 73-10. However, when you read that uh, action, they also are obliged to say that until a new system or new new remedy is um, made available that the tenants of these uh, of House Strait Resolution 192 and um, uh, Public Law 73-10 remain in place. So they took it away and made it look like it was gone. But then on the other hand, they said, well, but until we get something you know, else in place, uh, the tenets of these laws and, and everything will stay in place. So they have not at any time since 1982 come forward with a new plan, a new exemption, a new remedy, nothing. It's just sit, it's sitting there. So House Joint Resolution 192 and Public Law 7310, the tenants thereof and the obligations thereof are still in effect. All right, you couldn't make this stuff up. Um, and we are continuing to, to be harmed because we're not being, uh, we don't have access to the remedy and exemptions. They still haven't even named who, what officer in the government is responsible. They haven't set up a program by which you can just write to a specific agency or, you know, uh, fill out this form. Okay, they have nothing in place, even after all these years, they have nothing in place to actually provide the exemption and the remedy. And this is, a, you know, what we've experienced with the Sign in America program is, um, is very much um, indicative where, you know, one person gets their house mortgage paid off and another person doesn't. And it's in the same state. It may be from the same lender. We don't know why. Nobody's ever told us, um, you know, why, why does this go through and that one doesn't? Why, why, you know, and you can even take it to the same office for processing and it'll come back a completely different, you know, apparently arbitrary no or yes. And um, so under law, a, a remedy has to be applicable to everybody. It can't be, you know... Uh, upon the discretion or likes and dislikes of some particular office or officer. 
it has to be applied equally or it's not a law. Um, and this is very obviously public law 73-10, okay? So it's a law. Um, and, and we've had this problem ongoing with them and with the Sign in America program and with the claim of the exemption, the mutual offset credit exchange exemption all along. Now, you know, what we've got is the supersedious bond that was established by House Joint Resolution 192. Yet that is the insurance bond, okay? And that is what we're claiming against. Just blatantly, boom, right in your face. It's our congressionally designated right to, to claim against this supersedious bond that was established by House Joint Resolution 192 and by um, Public Law 73-10. I mean, it's right there in your face. And we even know the funding source of, of this bond. We, we don't even have to think about it. Because remember, as I told you, the asset belongs to you, the gold, you know, the gold belongs to you, and any credit that is um, resulting from using that um, gold for collateral is also yours, okay? Both the asset and the credit that is uh, being derived from that asset belong to the owner of the asset, okay? So what they did is they cashiered your gold. They took, the, took your gold from you. They cashiered it. And then they used that as the basis, the collateral, to receive loans of Federal Reserve dollars or notes, IOUs, from the Federal Reserve banks or from the IMF. If they needed to do business internationally, then they went to the IMF and they did the same thing. They said, okay, well, here's this big clump of gold that belongs to the American people uh, and we're representing the American people. So, um, you know, we want so much in credit based on their gold. Well, both the asset and the credit actually belong to you. It doesn't belong to your employees, right? Uh, your employees have acted out of school and done dirty work that has resulted in risk to you and to your assets without your permission. Okay, so these guys are on the stick for it. And as part of the remedy, what they basically said is that if you had any need for your gold or your um, credit coming off of that gold, you could instantaneously demand it and they would be uh, obliged to provide it. So you're going along, hook, healthy buck, and all of a sudden you get a property tax bill uh, for a municipal corporation franchise. All capital letters, it's a corporation. There's no doubt that it's a corporation and there's no doubt that it is a uh, municipal corporation franchise that's been named after you. So here's the municipal government knocking on your door saying, oh, by the way, you owe us this amount for snow plowing and, and uh, you know, road repairs and, uh, uh, you know, keeping up the utility easements and blah, blah, blah. You got a choice. You can either pay that out of pocket using brand new credit extended to them, right? Or you can say, eh, I don't feel like paying this out of pocket this year. I'm going to uh, claim my exemption and uh, do a debt swap instead. I'm going to do a moxie. And so, uh, but how do you do a moxie? And where do you send it? And who's responsible for providing this exemption and relief? Hmm? Well, they've kept their mouth shut about that since 1933. Nobody knows for sure. Nobody knows by what magical determination they decide who is owed the protection of the public law and who isn't. And so this is a major, 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 major issue. Now, we know which bond exists to pay these claims. It's the bond that was, it's a whole harmless bond 
created by House Joint Resolution um, 192 and by Public Law 7310. So there's your bond. And we have claimed against it. But like I'm telling you, uh, who gets it, who gets the benefit of that and who doesn't is completely arbitrary so far as we can tell. And there is no specific um, agency that is responsible. Now, obviously, the IRS has uh, some connection to this. And the U.S. Secretary of the Treasury has connection to this because that's how the bond is, is accessed and that's how the, the bond is held, respectively. Um, but it's, it's like they're offering access to some and they're not offering access to others and they're not making access plain and unobstructed. So this calls into question whether their entire system is illegal and whether they are individually as officers of the, this corporation responsible for doing this are criminals and liable for treason. Because if you, if you do something illegal and then you legalize it by offering exemptions and remedies and you don't provide those exemptions and remedies, it means that whatever it was wasn't legalized. The, the uh, collection of all that American gold, 20,000 metric tons of it, was illegal. The issuance of Federal Reserve notes in exchange for gold was illegal. And everybody who uh, has had their paws in this system since 1913 is a criminal, unless they provide the exemption and provide the debt swap at our demand. Now, I personally think, I, I assume, that they've been using the pretense of being at war and that they, the, the arbitrary nature, the, oh, this person gets their mortgage paid off, but this one doesn't. I think that this is, is an arbitrary thing based on factors like, uh, was your great grandfather a soldier for the Confederacy or not? You know, uh, I, I, I think that, um, there were numerous people in positions, uh, political positions, who didn't know the difference between a war and a mercenary conflict. And I think that they used the pretense of war to excuse a lot of their, their skullduggery and malfeasance and their arbitrary judgments against one person or another. So I think that what we're, what we're continuing to run into here are ignorant politicians, um, paralyzed military who do know, and uh, basically a uh, ignorance on the part of the general population. Because if the general population knew that they were owed a debt swap instead of taking uh, new credit out of their pockets, you can guarantee yourself that a lot of people in the general population would be stepping up and saying, hey, we're doing a debt swap. Anything that this corporate entity owes you is not owed by me. And, you know, I'm going to authorize you to take some of the tiny little bit of the credit that's owed to me to pay this off. It's going to be you know, just a straight across the board bookkeeping entry of credit paying off debit. That's called discharge. Okay, so we're going to discharge this debt. We're going to do a debt swap, and it's just going to even out and zero out, and that'll be that. Doesn't that sound a lot better than having to fork out, you know, $2,000 in extra credit to them? But of course, they want the new credit. They don't want to do a debt swap, even though a debt swap, in effect, does the same thing. See, they're kind of stupid, too. Um, a debt swap is like paying off their credit card 
so that now they have more headroom to, to spend. So it really doesn't matter to government operations whether it's a debt swap or it's new credit being extended to them out of the, the circulating currency. But they're kind of stupid that way too. Uh, anyway, uh, this is a huge question. Uh, it's something that maybe all the 50 state assemblies need to act upon. Uh, I think that we do need to um, bring the U.S. Secretary of State to bear on this issue. I do think that we need to um, bring it to the attention of the, uh, the Attorney General and the Inspector General, both. I think that JAG needs to be involved. I think that, that there needs to be a, um, a come to Jesus meeting about exactly uh, the, the uh, pretense of war so that people are no longer being um, wrongly uh, addressed under a pretense of war. And I think that access to these exemptions and these debt swap provisions, the mutual offset credit exchange exemption, needs to be um, brought forward front and center for all the state of state legislatures and all of the congressional delegations. And everybody needs to be poked in the butt over this, basically. And, you know, we can form the fulcrum for doing this because as state assemblies, the state assemblies have the right to demand the exemption and the uh, the debt swap provisions for their people. Would you like to share some language with us so that we can all try to? Yeah, um, this has been something that's been on my mind for, you know, months, uh, exactly how to approach that and, and you know, where to where to stick the pin um <laughs> hmm. so yeah i'm let me let me let me think about that because it is something that we need to address and we do know we know where the super cds bond is for that and um we just haven't been able to uh get any proper action out of them Hmm. Might need to push them a little bit. Might need to steer them a little bit. If you yeah, right. And and you know, I think the sign in coordinators, the sign in America coordinators, are um, you know certainly people that could uh, could help because they've been responsible for taking in all these claims, and they have kept the the tally running. You know. Yeah. And so they can demonstrate that, yes, uh, these are Americans who have sought this exemption and are owed this exemption, according to our records. And, uh, you know, here's the bill, bucko. And, and by the way, how are you going, who's going to be responsible to pay this and to do these debt adjustments on an ongoing basis? Mm hmm so, you know, the, the Sign in America coordinators have the records for all of, all, all of the offset um, requests. And maybe a first step would be to get the Sign in America coordinators to um, bring forward the, the current um, total of, you know, these, these are priority um, issues okay and then we could have a um you know I, i'm just searching for the right word uh, but we could have a, an action before the general assemblies um to push the um state of state organizations to push the uh u.s U.S. dot Department of the Treasury to um, get off its butt and actually provide a program and a, um, a defined means of accessing the supersidious bond that legalizes 
their entire system and has legalized it for the past over 100 years. Hmm. And if they fail to provide the remedy and fail to provide access to the remedy, then their actions are illegal and immediately they can no longer uh, support the Federal Reserve note. And I think it's also true that they can't provide the USD. Now, if you step back from this, kiddos, um, there are many powerful laws in the financial world that prohibit the use of uh, funds from illicit sources. Mm. This has been uh, true for many, many, many years. I mean, well over 150 years, way back before the, um, the Civil War, um, you could not use funds from illicit sources uh, in general uh, commerce of any kind, maritime or merchant. Hmm. So, you know, how, how is it that they are using a commercial script that is based on peonage, which is illegal source of funds? And even worse for the USD, which is only partially based on uh, the value added um, petroleum product value. Um, how is the USD being considered a uh, valid commercial script when uh, it's being funded by slave labor? Hmm. Illicit source of funds, mm -hmm. illicit, for, uh, illicit source of credit. Right. Uh, how are these credit notes being floated when the, the basis of them is criminal? Uh, you know, as far as I can see, uh, our complaint, which was duly lodged with uh, the Pope and with the Vatican Chancery Court and with the, um, the British, um, our, you know, the army officials and, and all the others, um, how can they can continue to use uh, credit notes based on enslavement and peonage and false claims of occupation? Hmm. You know, this is just, these are commercial corporations. They're, they're not armies. They're, they're mercenaries. They're here on our shores involved in severely illegal and unlawful actions. And they have been for a long time act, operating under color of law and disguise. So, you know, uh, this may be news to everybody, but both peonage, which is involuntary um, labor, and slavery, uh, which we all know what that is, have been outlawed worldwide since 1926. It was outlawed by a convention established by the League of Nations. And everybody says, well, the, legal nation, the League of Nations was disbanded, at, you know, because they failed to uh, prevent World War I and II. Well, hmm. but... All of those countries are on the record as having abolished peonage and slavery. So all the member nations are still just as, as uh, obligated to abolish uh, peonage and slavery as they ever were, whether or not the League of Nations exists anymore. And so I think that it's a matter of enforcement. I think that we need to... Um, to really bring all this stuff forward into the public view. Because what's lacking is you. What's lacking is me thinking about these things and taking action about them. Now, exactly what action we take, um, we, we need to put our heads together and, and come up with the answers, just like access to the debt swap. Uh, these are things that um, we can solve, that we have the tools to solve, um, but we need to, to put in the homework and, and the thought process and the actions uh, to bring the relief. So, you know, certainly we can bring forward all the claims that we've collected through the Sign in America program for the last five years 
and uh, we can point out all of the information that we have derived from that uh, endeavor and we can address the specific officers responsible at least in terms of even though they weren't specifically named in in the in the uh, acts of congress uh, they are however specifically in that realm you know for example we know that the uh, secretary of the treasury is in that realm we know that um, the board of governors of the federal reserve are in that realm we know that um, the sec is in that realm and speaking of the sec um, they are in receipt of securities based on peonage and enslavement So how are they getting away with that? Well, I love watching you answer your own question when they ask you a question. And then I can only imagine what's going to come after this. <laughs> and it's going to be like, <laughs> everybody get ready. Everybody get ready. <laughs> Um, we're waiting yeah. for instructions, Anna, because we are ready to do whatever. You got a whole army here. We're okay. Ready. Well, well, why don't we? Why don't we first of all uh, flag down the sign in America coordinators in each state, and uh, you know, get all the claims updated so we have a, a total number as of this date, as of uh, you know, April first, say, or. And, and then we um, get a some sort of an action before the general assemblies of all the state assemblies. And meantime, I figure out who in the hell needs to be addressed. Somebody and, better watch out. <laughs> and then and then we um, and then we go for it. We will let. Our North Carol our North Carolina person usually is watching, but I will make sure she knows. We will get to work. All of you other folks out there, are you paying attention? We'll put an announcement out everywhere we know how, Anna, and we'll let them know. We can talk about it again on Thursday with Michelle's group and make sure everybody there knows. I'll start making a lot of noise. we we just need we you give us instructions, Anna. We got it. We're going to let people know what to do. We're waiting. Also, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead. Each, state, each state's um, total can be listed. And then we can present the bill to the U.S. Department of the Treasury. And we can, I think we can force them to, to do the credit swap and erase whatever's there. And I think that maybe we should um, make the inquiry, do the footwork um, to identify things like mortgages that need to just be paid off in one fell swoop and not us having to continually go back on a monthly basis. I mean, we could do it on a monthly basis if there were a convenient means of doing that. But until there is a convenient means of doing that, then the other obvious uh, thing is to just pay off the mortgage, credit the mortgage, really, and discharge the mortgage is what I should be saying um, once and for all, because otherwise there's going to be a lot of money involved in keeping track of the accounting. Now, what they had discussed uh, initially was to have a special credit card that was for nothing but um, municipal expenses and another credit card that was nothing but territorial expenses. And you would use, you know, if, if the bill came to the all caps name, you would use the all caps credit card. And if the bill came to your name, upper lowercase, and it wasn't, and it was a franchise, then you would use the territorial credit card. Um, that never materialized. They never set up that program for whatever reason. Um, instead, the municipal government uh, went bankrupt, as you all know, uh, and uh, as a result, everything got confluid there. 
And then the territorial government also went through a bankruptcy reorganization, uh, which meant that everything was <laughs> messed up there for a, a number of years. So we've had the municipal government messed up since 2015. Uh, we had uh, basically three years of a reorganization of the territorial government. And now we are looking at uh, a situation where the international banksters are um, trying to cause more trouble. Uh, I think that, you know, if you really want to get down to the the problem, the problem is with the banks. Um, it's not so much the politicians. The politicians want to give you what you want. Uh, it's not so much the military. The military knows that it's a crock of shit. And I'm, when I'm talking about the pretense of war, they know it's, it's a mercenary conflict. But at the higher levels, they certainly know it's a mercenary conflict. Um, so... You know, if you look at all of it, it's the banks that are at the bottom of it. It's the banks that are the essential problem. It's it's the securities brokerages. Um, you know, if these banks were uh, abiding by uh, Hoyle and Doyle, they would uh, not be allowing the use of credit notes based on P and engine enslavement. Uh, if they were doing what they need to do. Uh, the Securities Exchange Commission would not be uh, trading in securities based on peonage and enslavement. Uh, the, 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 the entire problem, you know, if you really want to get down to it, the entire problem is with crooked banks uh, and crooked uh, brokerages. And um, It's not so much with the politicians or the military when it comes to this, it's, uh, it's the banks. You said that also like when you were talking about um, with Cal and his, he's never, he doesn't have a bank. So you have a bank. We have a bank and um, we have a banking system. We have an entire banking system that's separate from BRICS, separate from SWIFT, nice and clean. Clean and easy. Uh, we have uh, requests pouring in from all over the world from people wanting to participate in our bank. Uh, we have our AFD and we have our United States silver dollar. Uh, so we're, we're well equipped to um, actually uh, have our international trade bank functioning and dealing with physical assets. And we have uh, our commercial merchant bank uh, up and functioning so that we can deal with a uh, commercial script. So actually, uh, yeah, we're in a good position because of that. Uh, and we can um, begin the process of accepting bills of lading. Bills of lading, bills of exchange. Woohoo! Yeah. So yeah, um, this is a, this is an entire realm of of international trade that we've been locked out of for generations. And so now we can um, use law merchant, as I, I I explained the other day. There are two kinds of commerce. Commerce yeah. itself is business between incorporated entities or corporate entities, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's not business between you and me as people, right? Okay, so commerce is, is business between businesses. Two different kinds of commerce. Commerce that's under law merchant on the land and commerce that is under maritime commerce on the sea. Okay. So we have a bank now that is functioning under law merchant and international trade, both. So we can do whatever we want or need to do. 
So I think a lot of people are asking, you know, like after the show, Anna, like in all the various YouTube places, like all the places that we broadcast, they're wanting to know who is exchanging with the AFD or who has the ability to exchange with the AFD. Everybody. I mean, we have published, we have a published currency uh, that is defined as a certain amount of gold. Gold has a value on the world market every day. That value is compared and contrasted with every currency on, on the planet. Um, every, every day you get an exchange rate that is published um, that is based on a overall standard of exchange between countries. Um, the United States dollar trades against the Japanese yen. The Japanese yen trades against the Russian ruble. And there is an exchange rate that's published every day. Right. Uh, you know, is there one published for the American Federation dollar? That's the question they're asking me. They want me to show them. I don't have any way. I mean, I know how to do the math because you defined what it is. It's the one one hundredth of, of gold. And so we know the math like we can do the math. Right. But anybody can do the math and anybody can figure out how much it is in rubles. Anyone can figure out how much it is in yen. So what do they want me to show them besides that? Like, do they want me to show them? There's really nothing to show. I mean, it's, it's. Is it being traded somewhere, somewhere that they can see? That's what they want to know. I'm, I'm just asking for the, I'm asking for them. It's not for me. Of course it's being <laughs> traded. We're trading it. We're trading AFD all the time between ourselves. We're trading AFD as gold AFD currency with other countries. We've got other countries pouring through our doors, trading their silver for our gold. We've got their their silver. Uh, you know, we've got we've got all of this. We've got safekeeping receipts up the wazoo. We've got you know, silver and gold bonds that are under safekeeping receipt all over the world. We've got money that we've collected as commercial liens that have been owed forever by these people. So yeah, we're trading, but are we trading in what, you know, what we have our system set up. We are setting up our relationships with all our vendors. We can trade directly using QRC code connectivity between any vendor that has a QRC code. And now that's a lot of vendors because as you will see, more and more people are switching to the QFC or you know the, the QC code um, instead of using the barcode. Yes. So, Anybody that's using QRC can interact with us as a vendor and back and forth. So you can get your goods and services paid for. That's trading. Okay. Now, the problem is that the uh, Federal Reserve and the um, IMF have been trading in barcode and using the SWIFT system for transactions. So basically the Rockefellers did unto the bank transfer system exactly what they did to the oil transfer system and gained a monopolistic control over the bank transfer system just as they did with the oil transfer system. The difference is that they were busted for the oil transfer system monopoly and they haven't been busted yet for the bank transfer system monopoly, but they will be busted for it, okay? And that means that the Federal Reserve and the IMF will no longer have this chokehold on everybody's ability to transfer money. The BRICS system has already begun to crack that nut by setting up their own system of transferring um, international funds, okay? Right. So, uh, and here we come, uh, we have our own system that's totally independent that 
does all of the banking functions and which is enabled to function in international trade and international commerce. Okay, that's why we call it bilateral. It has the capability of doing both. It can do international trade out of the international trade bank side, and it can do commerce out of the commercial side, which is a, a merchant bank. So we have ultimate control over all of that. It's under our law and it's chartered under our government. So it's no longer a matter of people having to go through the rats and the crooks in order to trade with America. Which is why you were saying last night, like everybody should stop doing business with the Brits, period. Full stop. Right. Their government should be brought to its knees. It should be forced to change because in the past 300 years, it's been the the uh, the one const the one constant in all of the wars and all of the miseries that have been visited on the world in the past 300 years, the one constant is the government of Great Britain. I mean, I didn't make it that way. They made it that way. They did this. They earned this by their own actions. And so, you know, uh, we can look back over 200 years to the uh, Declaration of Independence, and we can see right there and then that the same problems that existed then with the British government continue to exist now with the British government. They have not changed. They have not improved. They haven't done anything but continue on uh, being a thorn in the flesh of the entire world. And they've continued to um, do by proxy and by guile exactly what they were doing in 1776. All of the oppressions listed in the Declaration of Independence have been revisited upon us under their British territorial Raj regime. And they have managed to get away with this without the rest of the world really knowing that they were doing it. And now that everybody should be awakened and fully cognizant of, of what uh, little bastards these these Brits have been and the, the, uh, the part of MI6 and so many of the terrible things that have happened, the wars, uh, the incursions, the overturning of governments, uh, the assassinations, um, the uh, obstruction of trade, the obstruction of commerce, uh, the monopolization of the bank industry, all this stuff, all of this stuff goes back to the Brits. The Americans have been used as gun fodder to promote it. The Americans have been used as the front men, as the storefront, uh, you know, and uh, have been blamed for what the Brits have been doing. And it just comes down to that. If you look at it and you actually study the issues, you'll see how they gained control of our bureaucratic um, and administrative systems and then just use that uh, to commandeer this country. And then they just lied and lied and lied and lied and lied to everybody about everything and used every form of secrecy and guile to promote and keep this system going, uh, despite the fact that it was illegal, unlawful, and immoral. And they didn't care. They, they just used everybody, friend and foe alike, uh, for their uh, power mongering, their war mongering, their profiteering, uh, and their benefit at the cost of the entire rest of the world. And they have not shown the least little bit of uh, change, the least little bit of regret. Uh, they haven't made any effort to, um, to, to assist their victims. They have done nothing but be very smug about their supposed superiority as criminals. Well, they are superior criminals. I will grant them that. But they are criminals nonetheless. And their government is a criminal institution. Britain is a rogue state. It's been a rogue state for 300 years. 
And I trace it all back to the Treaty of Utrecht, which was signed by Queen Anne in the early 1700s. It's been going full boat ever since. And the Brits have, have used their union of uh, their alliance that was created um, at the end of the English Civil War uh, in a very duplicitous and deceitful way. Because while their countries assumed that this was a, a peace treaty among the countries and an end to religious strife and things that had, had created this condition of war uh, in Britain, it actually was used to create a corporation. Great Britain is a corporation. It's a business. It is not a country. And I don't think that that was ever made clear to the people of England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. Uh, Great Britain was used as a corporation, and it was used for commercial purposes and for commercial war, for mercenary war. And that is what Great Britain has promoted un ever since 1689, they have promoted war war profiteering, and you can look at the history books and see the explosion of war in every quarter, in every part of the, the planet, ever since they did that. So what should happen and what must happen is that the, the British, quote unquote, Great Britain, has to be destroyed. It has to be, uh, it has to be taken out. It has to be destroyed once and forever with no, no ifs, ands, or, or maybes. The British people themselves have got to step up to the plate and take control of what has been masquerading as their government ever since 1689. And that means Westminster. That means um, the monarchy. It, needs, it means the whole kit and caboodle. And it needs to be changed. It needs to be fundamentally changed so that Britain is no longer at the bottom of every dog pile, so that the people of Britain are not guilty of crime by being accomplices to this. Uh, it, it's the same motivation that drove me off my couch. It's the realization that if you don't object and object in, in, in the highest terms that you reasonably possibly can. And if you don't bring it forward, then they get away with it by acquiescence and you are presumed to be an accomplice to the crime. William the Conqueror's problems that he thought he squashed back then are still going on today. That's what's going on. Right. Cynthia, All go. Okay. All right, so our sign-in America coordinator on North Carolina has had a running tally sheet of monthly expenses, quarterly expenses, and yearly expenses. This has been over a year, so we should just update that with our new people and get you totals, which we had all of our totals from before. I'll get it done. Thank you. I We're going to get that done. We're going to get it done. It's going to be awesome. As of April 1st, okay, all the sign-in coordinators, everybody that's listening to this, all the sign-in coordinators, all the assembly members, everybody be aware, we're going to do this. We're going to get a final tally as of April 1st, and then we are going to file against that super satius bond, and we are going to um, object uh, to the entire situation where we have been, uh, this was the only, uh, this was the only exemption and remedy uh, for what they did with the Federal Reserve note. And people have been instructed from receiving the remedy, therefore the Federal Reserve note, uh, the effort to legalize the Federal Reserve note failed. And so they're going to have to fix that or they're going to have to give up the Federal Reserve note. And I do believe that they're also going to have to give up the USD because that's been funded with slave labor. 
So just to clarify, Anna, I want to make sure everybody knows, like you've required us to take, we've taken the class, like the Sign in America uh, course. And so anyone who hasn't done that before April 1st wouldn't qualify for this piece right now. Correct? Correct. If, if you're brand new, but you can, you can file your claim and start. Okay. Because the action that we're taking now is going to um, then follow forward uh, to all of the new people too. So, so know. new people don't be discouraged. I just wanted to clarify that so that we all have that answer. So thank you for that. All right. All right. Well, we've gone way, way over. I wasn't going to stop you because, you know, you were just, vibing and we just needed to know and this is going to be fantastic thank you so much well thanks and for jogging my me awake because i have an 11 30 that i can't miss well we love you and everybody we will see you next week on tuesday and we are lifting you anna and james we love you thanks everyone thanks for all